So welcome to our next video of the beginnings of modern sport in the 19th century um, England and also colonial Australia. So we're looking specifically in this video, we're just looking at the meanings of amateur and professional sport. So sport at its earliest forms was played as an amateur status, which means that you weren't getting paid for playing sport. Um, in the 19th century, um, England especially, um, sport was played in an amateur status. However, uh, um, there was a difference between amateur sport and sports that were played by those who were quite wealthy. So sports that was amateur would be sort of rugby, football, perhaps, um, just trying to think, cricket, maybe another one that was amateur, but also played by the, the wealthy. The wealthy usually played tennis, uh, croquet, sailing, um, all the sports that obviously had a lot of bit more money. However, in the 19th century, um, it was a very working class time. So you would only play sport. Um, sport wasn't really necessary part of a, a person's everyday life. Um, as I said, only the wealthy would play sport as a pastime. Um, but the, the uh, people who, the working class, didn't have, either didn't have time or, or weren't allowed to participate with the, uh, the, the wealthy. It was a very rigid time in those, in those days. You know, you had the wealthy, the upper class, and you had the lower class, and they didn't really associate with each other. So sport wasn't really an opportunity for those who were in the working class. Um, until the uh, Factory Act of 1844, um, came around where it allowed workers at least a half a day off a week um, off work. So imagine back in the 19th century being middle, lower class, you have to work seven days a week and that was pretty much long hours too. So the Factory Act of 1844 came in and uh, ensured that these workers at least got a half a day off per week. So it might have been the Sunday afternoon, you know, after 12, you've got that day off. So that gave them a bit more opportunity to get involved with their sporting pursuits and, uh, and participate in, in some organized sport amongst each other. It wasn't until the late 19th century where professional sport began. And so um, people were starting to get paid for their participation in sport. Um, boxing was one of the first sports to, to start paying their athletes, um, well, their participants, you could say. And um, some people actually paid to lose bouts. So, um, and that was an example. Another one too, gave them a bit more time uh, to involve themselves with gambling. So horse racing would be another one where the middle class would participate uh, and try and make a little bit more money off a sport. Up to the 20th century, um, sport became a little bit more professional. So. Um, people who were, were participating in high levels of sport was able to have some time off to go and travel and participate and get a little bit more money for their involvement in sport, but still they had to hold down jobs. Um, and this also gave them time to travel and so forth to participate in their sport and to represent their country. And this gave them their semi-professional status. So a lot of sports today are still semi-professional. We see the uh, netballers, um, they're just about to get into the more professional uh, status. However, a lot of them still um, hold down their own full-time jobs while still representing their netball state. Rugby union is an example of how sport was started amateur, became professional. Um, a lot of, in about the late 1800s, um, a lot of rugby union clubs started charging people to play for their clubs. And so a lot of players usually would come from the high wealthy schools. Um, and we know a lot of schools in Sydney that are still um, rugby influenced. And, um, and we know that rugby union is, is what was considered to be played amongst the, the, uh, the upper class, as we could say. So rugby union was basically, um, it started becoming a professional sport, but were only played and only exclusive to the upper class. So a lot of the uh, working class um, sort of, you could say, protested about this. And so started developing their own sport. And um, that sport now is, is called rugby league. And 
the, so it was a whole bunch of people that broke away from the rugby union um, status and developed their, changed a lot, some of the rules. And so that's how rugby league began. And although rugby league is uh, still, is a professional sport now, it's always still, it still is considered as the uh, working class um, sport. No, they're different. Like the yes. Rugby, yes, the rugby league has themed rounds. For example, they'll have women in league round or indigenous yes. round or yes. retro round, whereas rugby union every week is white rich men round. Ah, oh, yes. You see the difference every so, single week. So it's very similar. To, yeah, there it is right there. Look at it. Now I'm getting it. It's similar to the bounce. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, that wonderful program. Yeah. Yes, down, down south. Yes, absolutely. Hello, the frills and the boys down there. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> but there's a lot of differences, Mick. There are other differences between league and union. Like league will have uh, you know a round where you can bring the kids in for free or something, whereas union have bring your butler round. <laughs> <laughs> Australia's earliest professional um, event, you could say, was called the Storwell Gift, and the Storwell Gift was a, a short race where people would sort of spend. Um, or gambled a lot of money basically on the winner. It's still quite popular. It started in 1876 and it's still considered as, as um, Australia's oldest and richest short event. Many of the runners were also um, indigenous, uh, young indigenous Australians. So it was probably one of the first times that indigenous people were actually allowed to play sport in the Australian colony. Still on that to topic of indigenous, a lot of in young indigenous uh, males participated in boxing and, uh, and that, that, was what, that was a sport which a lot of indigenous people were attracted to. Um, however, back in those days, a lot of indigenous people, young people were exploited and so they were made to participate in boxing uh, matches with very much minimal pay or, or no pay at all. And it was basically pure for entertainment and financial uh, purposes of those who were promoting it. So if we were to look at the amateur and professional sports today, we see that just recently um, sports, well I wouldn't say recently, but over the last uh, 20 years, rugby league, especially as it merged into the 90s, became a professional sport. So the, um, so the, the players no longer had to hold down jobs. Uh, the sport and training was basically their full-time job. Uh, and that's the same with other sports such as AFL, rugby union, um, football or soccer, which we, we also call it. They all have full-time statuses and we sort of see it's mainly all male sports, male-dominated sports. Female sports are becoming professional um, and there's a lot of professional athletes out there such as those who um, represent us at the Olympics, um, and we're seeing an emergence, like I explained before, netball is becoming uh, more professional. Women's AFL has actually grown quite extraordinarily. You know, just recently they were paid a lot of money for a, a six week or an eight week uh, tournament. Uh, we see that the cricket now, um, we've got cricket males have been professional for quite a while now. Now we've just seen recently uh, contracts given to female athletes um, on a full-time basis, and they will also represent Australia. So we're seeing a bit more um, of exclusive of female sports, which we'll look at um, in the next topic. However, coming from um, sports that were basically amateur, and which sports they had to also play and train in their own time while naming down a full-time job, and now seeing that that's their full-time job, is being a sport athlete. Um, and the Olympics is one event that used to be highly, completely amateur sportish. Uh, those who participate were amateur. We're now seeing that sometimes you've got professional sports or sports people being involved in Olympics. So all, although Olympics is considered still to be an amateur um, sporting event, um, there's a lot of professionals that do represent their country who are totally there just for their sport. So that's all we have for the meaning in amateur sport. So that's our next dot. That was our next second dot point. So our third dot point uh, for this unit is on women's historical participation in sport. And that will be the next video.